This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Prime Spark, the podcast that brings you conversations that inspire, celebrate, and empower women over 55. The second women's revolution is here, and it is time for us to fuel a spark that will ignite your way forward, illuminate your path, and reflect your gifts in the world. Now, here is your host for Prime Spark, Sarah Hart. Hi, and welcome to Prime Spark. I'm Sarah Hart, and I'm so happy you're here. Prime Spark is designed for women over 55 or close, with a goal to help us all live our happiest, most fulfilling, and productive lives now and in the future. The mission of Prime Spark is to change the way our society sees and treats older women. That's a big mission, which only means we all need to be involved and we need to get started now. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Vicki Larson, a woman whose work I greatly admire. Vicki Larson is a longtime award-winning journalist at a San Francisco Bay Area newspaper, author of Not Too Old for That, How Women Are Changing the Story of Aging, and co-author of The New I Do, Reshaping Marriage for Skeptics, Realists, and Rebels, named a best book in 2014 by Pop Sugar. A resident of Marin County, California, Her writing can be found in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, AARP's The Ethel, Eon, Y, Quartz, Huffington Post, and Medium. Welcome, Vicki. I'm so happy you're here. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here and talking to you. So just in getting started, let me ask you, Do you experience getting older? And if so, what is that experience? And if not, why do you think it is that you don't? Um, Well, I I do experience getting older. All I have to do is look in the mirror every morning and go, what fresh hell is this? Because things are happening in the last, uh, I turned 65 last summer. And uh, in the last year or so, I have developed jowls, which I never had before. <laughs> so that was that was a wonderful thing. But at the same time, um, and and also, you know, um, things are happening to my body. I'm a little stiffer in the morning. I've got arthritis in the neck. The usual Michigas that happens. Um, so I'm experiencing that, and also I, I just really have never felt better and as I write in my book juicier than I have in um, since I turned uh, you know since I became midlife and um, and so I acknowledge that um, I might be seen a certain way in the world but I don't feel that way I feel you know better and a lot of my girlfriends all around the same age as I am um, feel the same way too so we're on to something. That is fascinating, Vicki. I have interviewed so many women over 50 or 55 or close, and I haven't done statistics on this, but I know 98% have said exactly the same thing. Well, when I get up in the morning, I'm a little stiffer. When I look in the mirror, I think, where did that wrinkle come from? But Other than that, I feel better than I've ever felt. I feel more alive, more me, uh, more really who I am and meant to be. And that that is true for everybody I talk to. It's really fascinating. And it's time that society caught on to that. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we've all heard these horror stories about older women, there's nothing ever positive said about older women and the narratives um, make most women fear getting older. 
And, I, you know, it's really important that we, we, we challenge those. Like what is, we've been getting older since we've been born. And what is the fear? Because a long life aging means you're alive. And alive is really good. So to change the narrative, it should be, well, how do I want that future older me to live? You know, what world do I want for her? And, you know, um, we often look back at our younger selves when maybe we thought we were not pretty or not smart or too fat or all of the negative things that a lot of young women feel about themselves and perpetuated in the media. And we often want to look back at that young girl and go, oh, honey, you know what? Look at this wonderful woman you became. Look how smart she is. Look how vibrant she is. Well, I really would like to change the conversation for us to do that with our future selves. I would love for women to treat our future selves like Lady Gaga did to Liza Minnelli at the Academy Awards a few months back. And she said, I got your back. I want women to look at their future selves and go, I got your back. I love that. That is, uh, that is really a wonderful way to see it. I mean, when I hear women, I mean, I love having birthdays. I mean, you know, bring them on because I'm not ready for the alternative. And getting older is actually a gift that so many women in this world don't have. They don't have the gift of getting older. And so we're actually very, very fortunate. Um, so I, I love the perspective you just are talking about. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, we've seen in, in the last two years since the pandemic started just how fragile and tenuous um, life is. And it can I mean, things can happen at any moment. And so therefore, um, to really celebrate every day, I know it sounds cliche, but really to celebrate that, oh, I am alive right. and, you know, I can make things happen and I'm not too old for whatever it is everyone's telling me I'm too old for because I am alive. Right. So you have a wonderful book. Uh, not too old for that. I love this book. And in it, you say many things that I underlined and dog-eared and put post-it notes. And one of them was, the more roles a woman has that aren't related to fertility and childbearing, the more positive they generally feel about aging. Can you explain that? That's a powerful sentence. Yeah, well, that came from a study that I'm I'm not going to be able to recall, recall right now. It's just, you know, um, for, for maybe my mom's generation. Uh, so my mom died about 10 years ago um, and she was 81. So, you know, my mom's generation, when women were very, very constrained on what they could or couldn't do, motherhood and being a wife was the most important roles that they ever could have. Um, and, you know, we've come so far from that. We have so many women who are in the workplace and so many women who with advanced degrees, I mean, it's just life has really opened up for women. And so we're not just bound at looking at our lives as just being a mom and, and, and being a wife. And um, because I, what happened was when you were no longer fertile, then, uh, you know, the, the narratives in the books were like, well, what's your purpose anyway? I, I remember um, my parents had a lot of sex books in their bedroom. Um, and that's where I got a lot of my sex education from. <laughs> one of the books was um, everything you've always wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to ask. And in the book written by a man, of course, was saying that, you know, when a woman's ovaries shrivel, um, she's just biding her time basically. And I'm like, what, what? So, um, so, if a woman, uh, and I don't, I wish I could ask my mom, like, mom, did you really believe that? Or ask my dad that, but uh, what a horrible, horrible thing to say. 
but I think for women, for her motherhood and, and wifehood was their defining factor. When that is taken away, then of, of course you, especially if you're reading books like that, of course you can feel bad. But that's not really how we live anymore. And and even in that day, you know, Margaret Mead would talk about the postmenopausal zest that most women felt after um, their fertile years were over. You know, a woman at midlife right now who, you know, um, she's got 30, 40, 50 more years ahead of her if she's luckily. What do we need to be sitting around waiting because our ovaries are shriveled? Imagine if we talked about men's genitals that way. A man is only vibrant as long as his, his, his testicles are working well or something. I mean, you never hear that. <laughs> Plus, their testicles and everything seem to work a little better a little bit longer. And so they, <laughs> they get that. I get yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so you also said, Vicki, and I find this absolutely fascinating also. In what ways are we marginalized? In what ways are older women marginalized? And in what ways are we helping to contribute to our own marginalization and those of other older women? Well, oh, yeah, you know, that is a big question. So ageism as you know, is a huge problem in uh, our society where the focus is on youth and beauty for women, especially. And it's a very, very narrow view of what's beautiful and it's a very short time. Um, so, so women do, once they have lost that, um, we are shoved uh, away and like we have no reason for you or no purpose for you. Um, and if you are a woman of, uh, of color or you're a woman who's not heterosexual or you're a disabled woman, you're even you're marginalized doubly, triply, quadruply. And um and so part of the reason why I wrote the book, which is not really tackling, tackling ageism per se, there are a lot of great books on that, but we have to start with our own ageist and sexist beliefs that we have internalized after hearing all this crappy messaging throughout our life. I do tell a story in the book about going to see a singer songwriter I loved all my life. It was the first time I saw her and she came out on stage with her long, long gray hair and clearly no Botox and no makeup. And she was wearing a dress that revealed a bit of a thick midlife uh, midriff. And my first thought was like, <gasps> she looks so patronly. And then I was like, so, I hated myself. I was like, what? She is so talented. She is so such a philanthropist. She's such an activist. This is what you're focusing on? And, and I understand that our brains kind of go to that right away. It's that fight or flight kind of thing. Like, is this thing going to eat me? Well, she was not going to eat me. I was up in the balcony anyway. First row might have been a problem. But um, it's, so it's what do you do with that information after? How do you change that conversation in your own brain? And then, then you can talk with your friends and you can talk to, you know, our daughters and, and other women about what they're feeling and what have they internalized that keeps us feeling marginalized. Yeah. But the conversation has to start with us. So how how do we do that? I mean, that, that's fascinating that you I remember that story in your book. And I thought, I bet Becky and I were in the same audience that night. Um when she was <laughs> I'm on, not naming names. <laughs> not naming names either, but it was in San Francisco and it was supposedly her farewell tour, and it was a magnetic <laughs> night. And how do we how do we change? I mean, I agree it's, a, it's, it's initially an inside job that we've got to change our own um, reaction, our own thoughts, our, our own narrative for that whole thing. But how do we do that? I mean, it's, it's, it's an instantaneous reaction. It so is. what do we do? So 
Yeah, like you do have to then think about why that was your first reaction and how can you change it. And so like after that, um, I looked at kind of, well, so I am an editor at, at uh, a San Francisco Bay Area uh, newspaper in the lifestyle section. And I've started looking for ageist sexist language in some of the um, columns and stories that I have. And I edit them out. There was um, one of my uh, freelancers had had a, had some language about, a, a, you know, a crazy cat lady. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm taking that out because that's offensive and it's a trope that needs to end. So I think once we can recognize in ourselves the way we perpetuated those narratives, we can be aware in our work if we are you know, in paid work, we can be aware of the way we talk amongst our friends or family, you know, oh, I had a senior moment or oh, this or that, and think, what is the language that I'm using that is harmful? And, and also then, you know, to talk to um, the younger women in our lives about this time in our life and the, you know, emphasis on, you know, what messages is society sending them that they don't like, that they would want to change. And so it's, it, 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 then it can snowball, you know, the more we're aware of it, the more we can, and then we can become activists too, if we wanted to, you know, we can choose not to buy certain products or services that perpetuate ageist, sexist um, advertising. Um, or we can write letters to the editors of papers or whatever. We have, we don't have to just sit back and take it. And it's one thing that this generation of women is doing because there is social media is they're going, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, just look at all of the conversations that Gen X women who are hitting midlife now are having on social media about menopause. We weren't really talking about menopause, but they're like, they want to talk about menopause. They want to know. So we can help move that along. I love that. I love the, um, the any work that anyone is doing that is intergenerational because um, I don't know if you saw it, but some time ago now, there was this, um, there was this uh, article that somebody had written on LinkedIn that showed little kids, little tiny kids going to grade school. And it was um, like a hundred years. There was something about that. And they were all dressed as old people. As yes, they, I remember that. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And they were, they were all hunched over. A couple of them had a walker. And I'm thinking, gee, many Christmas. I mean, this, this starts when we're tiny about being, this is what being old means. It It's true. And you know, and that's harmful. It really is. Um, so we, we, we do have to change that. And I mean, there was a um, I think it's a preschool in Seattle. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think so. That has um, people from the local nursing home in uh, working with the kids and they're doing projects with them. And they're like, you know, more grandmas and grandpas than their own. And then they see, well, oh, look, here's, you know, that it, so you can, we, we just have to make an effort to do it. Right. Um, we really do. And, um, and like, what a beautiful and wonderful thing to, to do instead of keeping, you know, older people away or younger people away. Um, just melt everybody, melt people. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Sky Bergman, who did the, um, uh, she is uh, doing wonderful work. And one of the things she discovered in some of her work was there are now young children who have no older people in their lives because um, they, they move, you know, without the mobile society, there's not, uh, they're not around their grandparents anymore. They may see them once or twice a year. Um, so that kind of interaction, I think, is really important. 
uh, for all sorts of reasons. It, it is. Yeah. And so as a society, we should be really promoting that because yes, you're right. A lot of people live far from, I mean, my kids were, um, my parents only grandkids and my parents lived in Florida and, um, I'm in California and, um, their dad's grandmother was just not, was really not interested in, in doing much of grandmothering or even being around very much. So, you know, um, that was a sad thing for, for my kids and for me and for my parents as well, right. you know, um, because yes, just seeing them a few times a year. Um, but I live in, a, I live in a, um, in a neighborhood where, there are, um, it's multi-generational. And so they got to experience that, not in the kind of loving grandmother way, but just the fact that they were, well, as a matter of fact, one of their caretakers when I, um, when they were very young um, was a, a woman who lived a few doors down, a, a widow. She was in her seventies, I think then. And yeah, they, they, she looked after my kids for a few hours. Yeah, that's and, great. It was great. It was really wonderful. But, you know, yeah, I mean, we we have tended to separate the ages. And I I'm a big believer in like intentional communities where you have people of all generations, all races, all beliefs, creating a community to look after each other. I think that is something I would I would love to see going forward, you know, when we come out of whatever financial <laughs> recession or whatever that's what we're in right now or still heading toward. Um, we have to, I mean, the pandemic is giving us a chance to really think about how we want to live in the future. We've already seen the incredible inequities that ha that this has uncovered. And so if we're going to move forward, I mean, people talk about going back to a normal. Normal wasn't really great. I think we should go to something better and we should all be working toward that together. Absolutely agree. Um, I don't I don't want to go backwards. Um, no. You know, one of the other things you talk about in your book that I, I found fascinating was you talk a lot about different kinds of friends that um, women have. And I have frequently actually heard older women talk about that they find it di more difficult to make new friends as they get older. Mm -hmm. have, you heard, have you heard older women talk about that? Is that anything you've heard? Yeah, not even just older women, but it, well, yeah, women at midlife or so. You know, part of the problem is in this society is that it's a very, very coupled society. And so when, you know, couples get together, they spend a lot of time together. And if they're having children, um, that takes a lot of time. And we forget to nurture um, our friendships because we we, we prioritize romantic relationships over platonic relationships. And then later on in life, if you've moved or maybe you've moved for a, a, a romantic partner and you know no one, um, you know, now you've been um, kind of isolated from that. And that is when you really, really want to have the support of friends. So I, I would hope that people do um, nourish the friendships they have and look for ways to put themselves in situations where they can meet people, what I call accidental friendships sometimes that have happened to me so delightfully at a dog park where I take my dog every day. Like we just always see a woman there and we started chatting and now it's like, well, now she she's she's on a trip right now and i'm like god she better get home soon because i miss her and, and now she's a friend we have dinner together and so on and so look for opportunities to do that we really do we do need friendship you know and and and, and even if you have a romantic partner um 
you know, a romantic partner can only do so much. It's a big burden to be someone's everything. So, you know, maybe you travel with this friend and maybe you and a book club with that, or maybe you go to movies with that friend um, and then your romantic partner can do whatever they want to do. Um, and, you know, the age of widowhood in uh, America is 59, which is really young, the average age. And COVID, of course, has push the needle on that because a lot of it, more men have died from COVID than women. And so eh, friendships at that time in life is, is very important. You know, it, yeah. Yeah. I think um, I, at one point I was, I was thinking about this and I thought just from what things people say, I was thinking everybody should get a dog. Because I don't, how many people talk about meeting new friends, walking their dog? <laughs> okay, the, the cure, one of the cures for this is to get a dog. <laughs> oh, Sarah, I'll tell you this. You can go to the dog park without a dog. <laughs> <laughs> or you can offer to, to walk a neighbor's dog. <laughs> I mean, there are people at the dog park with no dogs. And, you know, that's fine, too. <laughs> So another question I had about a section of your book, you have pathologizing femaleness. Hmm. Can you explain what you mean by that? That's fascinating. You mean in, um, in, in, me in medical terms of around menopause? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, menopause was a relatively, it's, it's not a really, old, old term. It's a relatively new in the grand scheme of things. Um, and so um, doctors historically have been men. And even the women who were like uh, midwives and doulas and everything way back when, well, those were like the witches and the ones to burn at the stake. I mean, women were really excluded from their own um, bodies and functions, um, being able to uh, learn about it and help other women with it. And so the male doctors would, you know, everything was, there's always something wrong with women. We don't really know what it is. So let's call it hysteria. <laughs> I mean, back in the day, you know, I thought our wombs wandered around. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> and so normal, normal functions that a woman would have, like menstruation, like menopause, were suddenly medical conditions, and they were wrong, or they were bad, because men didn't have them. So there was something really fundamentally wrong with women. And that language, of course, is very, very damaging. Now you say, well, we don't, I mean, no one believes that anymore. There's no wandering wombs or, or, you know, things like that. And yet there still is a lot of that misogynistic language and beliefs within the medical community. And um, I'm actually working on a story right now on how to talk to your male partner about menopause and a startling fact that I think I have in the book is that doctors get maybe an hour uh, training on menopause and some got none. And I'm like, wow, 50% of the population is women and doctors are not even learning about the most basic thing that's going to hit every woman they know their mother, their daughters, their aunties, their grandmothers, their coworkers, their bosses. <laughs> and so we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just as you were saying that, Vicki, what I was thinking of was we have learned that uh, menstruation and menopause are problems. Yeah. And so I think for a lot of us, that's the way we experience it. Absolutely. And I think we wouldn't have to experience it that way if we hadn't heard what a problem it is. So that's, um, I hope, 
I hope that changes. Um, and and it and I think it will. I mean, if if young women now are talking about it online, then that's a wonderful step in the right direction, in my opinion. I agree. And you know. I have a love hate with social media, but it can do good if it elevates the voices of women and to have these very important conversations about our bodies. And we're seeing in America right now that um, our rights to control our own body may be taken away by men who don't even understand how our bodies work. Right. This is this is dangerous. It's dangerous. So we need to um, really have some conversations about women's health because it's it's hurting us. It right. really is. Yes. Yes. So What's next for you, Vicki? What have you, what dreams have you not yet realized that are there in the back of your mind thinking, (laughs) oh, yeah, sometime I'm going to do that? Well, you know, I I did have plans to kind of back off from 40 hours a week work and maybe rent out my house and go live abroad for a bit or do a little bit of traveling. covid came and said, no, Vicki, that's not happening for you. Not now. So, um, so, but I am looking for ways to lessen the 40 hour work week. Um, but I, I have another book that I'm haven't, we haven't signed the contract yet, but, um, pretty sure that's going to happen. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, and you know, um, just really taking time to enjoy all this beauty that's around me, you know, to get on my bike, to get on the trails, to, um, you know, celebrate my kids, my friends, um, and just, you know, um, just continue to age uh, boldly. Boldly, (laughs) yes. Boldly. Yes. Well, this has been wonderful, Vicki. Thank you. Um, can you say anything about your new book or do you not want to talk about it yet? Oh, I can, yes, because I've written quite a bit about it and it's included in um, my first book, which was co-written and um, uh, not too old for that. It is about um, live apart together relationships. Um, it's a, a lifestyle that a lot of it's mostly driven by women, not only, but mostly um, women who are seeking independence um, and freedom, but still wanting a romantic partner. And so I'm going to be writing it in conjunction with a Canadian woman I met on Facebook. We've never actually met in person, Um, but she's making a documentary on it. And we are calling it a partners um, because she is in a, a partnered relationship with her romantic partner for 23 years. And so we're very excited um, about this growing phenomenon. It really is a growing um, lifestyle choice, not people who are living apart because they can't find jobs in the same place or they're going to different schools, but actively choosing to to live separately or or to have separate bedrooms in the same house. So, yeah, I was just reading, I think yesterday in one of the Sunday, I think it was one of the Sunday papers. And it is it, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to remember this well enough, but um, I think it, it, the point was that it has become such a, a quote movement that they're calling it lat living yes. apart together. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's gotten its own acronym. I mean, it's just, I, I love it. That's amazing. Isn't that? Oh. Yes. And so this will be the definitive how to do it book, how to do it not, book. So not saying that it's better and it certainly isn't for everyone. It's an option if you're interested. So right. we're, we're very excited about it. Okay, well, all of you who are listening, look for this book that will be coming out. And if it's something that is of interest to you, this will be very helpful. 
So, Vicki, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, how could they do that? Well, it's very hard not to find me under the Internet. <laughs> I write very often for Medium um, at OMG Chronicles. I'm on Twitter at OMG Chronicles. I do have a, my own website, OMG Chronicles. And um, I'm at OMG Chronicles at gmail.com. So, and I'm on LinkedIn. So I do, uh, and on Facebook too, all o- as OMG Chronicles, which seem like a good, name at the time but now it's like okay (laughs) but um, okay say that say that more slowly because i'm not understanding what you're saying oh omg like oh my god chronicles chronicles okay yeah so omg chronicles.com would get you um yes i think it's probably vicky lart yeah i think so um but omg chronicles at gmail.com is a way to reach me, but also Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of the stuff. <laughs> so it's uh, V-I-C-K-I-L-A-R-S-O-N. And it sounds like you can just find Vicki lots of places if you just <laughs> type it in. So that's our time today. Please join us again. You can find our Prime Spark podcast on every popular outlet. Find out more about Prime Spark at www.primesparkwomen.com. Thank you so much to my guest, Vicki Larson. And don't forget, you can find her at OMG Chronicle in Facebook, her website, lots of places. Just put it in and it'll come up. So thank you for being with us. Take care. Spread tolerance and love. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on Prime Spark. With each episode, Sarah Hart brings you conversations that inspire, celebrate, and empower women over 55. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes about remarkable, experienced women, go to EWNpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available at Spotify, Apple Podcast, and most other major podcast sites. The second women's revolution is here, and we hope that you use the insights you've gained here to fuel the spark that will ignite your way forward, illuminate your path, and reflect your gifts in the world. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why is it so hard to make a buck? (laughs) I know I have. Hi, I'm Sandra Yancey, founder and CEO of eWomen Network. What I have discovered after going from the brink of bankruptcy to running a multi-million dollar award-winning business is this. You can't build a million dollar dream hanging around minimum wage mindsets. My mission is one million women entrepreneurs generating $1 million in annual revenue. So here's what I've done. I've created the mother of all entrepreneur success programs that you can access online on your time. It's called Monetize Me Now. It's a seven module online course that is 100% my success formula, covering mindset, mission, management, motivation, marketing, and measure. Come on, take my hand and I'll show you the way to learn to earn flowing revenue for your business. Visit monetizemenow.com for details. Calling all speakers. eWomen Network has speaking engagements all over North America that must be filled. Are you a gifted messenger, author, expert, or successful entrepreneur that can help women entrepreneurs grow their businesses? Our mission is to help 1 million fulfilled women each achieve $1 million in annual revenue. If you're a speaker that can help women prosper, go to eWomenNetwork.com and sign up as a pro member of our Speakers Network. That's eWomenNetwork.com. Thanks for listening. This is the EWN Podcast Network.